Sally Fliss. I am the Sustainable Ag Field Manager for Nutrient Ag Solutions. So I work with my team to get out in the field and implement all our different sustainability pilots, whether it's working with our partners like Corteva or downstream suppliers to help meet their sustainability goals working through our grower base. Uh, I've been with Nutrient since January, and before that I was with the Fertilizer Institute in Washington, D.C., working on our for our nutrient stewardship programs across the country. And I'm Emma, I'm the uh, science lead for Corteva's Carbon Program, and I'm also the Director of Sustainability Science uh, at Granular. So I'm uh, responsible for all of the thinking through the quantification, the data collection, the rigor on that side of things, um, and really work closely with the rest of the team to implement our carbon program. Been with Granular Corteva since 2016. Um, and uh, before that, got a PhD in ecology. So I like thinking about numbers and science and stuff. So we are working with Corteva on a pilot with the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium, or ESMC which is a nonprofit based member organization that works to, that is working to develop and launch a complete ecosystem service market. So not just carbon credits or emission reduction credits, but water quality, other ecosystem services like habitat and diverse, biodiversity as well. This year's pilot, uh, we're working to help sign up 10,000 acres in Indiana as part of the pilot that um, larger pilot that Corteva's with. And we're really excited about this pilot. I think this is an opportunity to partner with Nutrien. Both of us are founding members of ESMC. So it's a really awesome opportunity to sort of bring this to life. And I think one of the things that we were really excited by was the fact that I think both of us have the same approach to this, which is really like, how do we partner across these different industries and these different groups to bring this opportunity to farms rather than each of us trying to sort of own our own slice of the pie to just really bring this directly to farms, to make it easier for them to farm sustainably and to get value out of those, those additional practices and outcomes. I mean, I think the biggest thing is we don't want to replicate and duplicate efforts, right? So it's already really painful for a farm to have to sign up for all these different state and federal cost share programs to get access to these different little pieces of programs. We want to make this really easy. And we've seen this fall apart before, right, with the carbon and climate exchange, where the Chicago Climate Carbon Exchange, TCX, <laughs> um, acronyms is also just the worst in this space. Uh, so it's really important, I think, to, to work together to not duplicate efforts and to make it really easy for farms. Yeah, I would agree there. I mean, the, the hard part of this is um, we want to bring the most value back to the growers for the work that they're doing on the ground in sustainable practice implementation. But there is a lot of background cost and time and effort and data collection and modeling and soil sampling and water sampling and all kinds of stuff that goes into generating these credits, which at the current market don't really have a super high value. So if the grower had to cover the cost of developing a credit beyond the practice implementation, there wouldn't be a positive return there for a grower right now. And so the more we can work together with other partners and through larger groups like ESMC, the more we can bring that cost down and bring more value back to the growers for the practices and the carbon and other ecosystem benefits that they're bringing back to the landscape. Ultimately, we are all trying to measure the same outcome, regardless of what program we're in, right? Which is like carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas or water quality. And there shouldn't be seven different definitions for how those get measured. Those same metrics get measured across seven different programs. Mm -hmm. So we're really focused on like, how do we get the single set of measurements metrics that we can all work on so we all speak the same language and require the same sets of, of data and standards for the space. I, I mean, th I think learning more about each other as companies and programs is probably personally one of the things that's super valuable to us is how do we interact? I mean, we know the traditional relationship between a company like Corteva and a company like Nutrient Ag Solution, that kind of buy-sell relationship that we've already got and continues um, going forward. But how are there other ways that we can optimize the work that we're doing across companies and really learn more about what sort of what makes each other's companies tick and how we can have and meet similar goals because at the end of the day, the grower is our customer and we're trying to make everything work um, to the best of that, that customers. Yeah. Likewise, I think um, 
from the beginning, we knew that we did not want to own or try or attempt to own the entire carbon space for our customers and just give them a lot of choice and flexibility. And so this is an opportunity for us to figure out actually how does that work on, on the ground and really trial that out with Nutrien. Um, so we're really excited about that opportunity to be able to say, like, really put our money where our mouth is and put our programs where our mouth is and say, how does this actually work when we partner and do that work? Can we make this easy for a farmer? Um, so we're also really excited to learn together. I think it's that whole acre solution piece and understanding, helping the grower and all the crop consultants we've got in the field understand that carbon is a great opportunity, but sustainability is a good investment. And there's a return on your investment for doing more sustainable practices around fertilizer management, soil management, edge of field practices that are gonna bring that grower value whether or not they fit into a carbon program. So the carbon programs are really exciting and great if we can continue to bring additional value back to the farm, but the real value is selecting the right suite of whole acre solution practices to implement and keep making that farm more productive and more profitable year over year. Yeah, totally agree. I think the other thing that gets me excited is honestly, the outcome-based nature of these programs. These are these are really focused on getting paid for outcomes, which means that we don't mandate any specific practice, right? Mm-hmm. Which is really what, what this is all about anyway. This is about carbon sequestration or water quality or those sorts of outcomes. And I don't actually care if you cover crop or not, right? We only care about what those outcomes are driven by that cover cropping. And cover crop may not make sense for your operation, and that's okay. Like, cover crops are not a, like a moral good here. Um, so I'm really excited about this shift towards how do we actually operationalize outcome-based practices, because I feel like that gives farms a lot more flexibility to say, okay, what makes sense for my operation? What kind of combination of things do I want to do to meet all those other agronomic and other sustainability goals that I might be interested in? So I'm, I'm super excited to see that shift to outcomes. Yeah, and that's, that's, that is, I would totally agree there, Emma. It's really nice to think about giving the growers, especially in ESMC, that opportunity to have a little more selection. So we've focused on, in our pilots, there's still a lot of talk around your typical practices of no-till and cover crops and um, you know the nitrogen management piece. But ESMC, if you look at everything that qualifies is really lets the grower be able to make that decision. So using the tools that we have digitally on both sides, figuring out with growers, is there a good spot to go out and plant a pollinator habitat that we know is going to sequester carbon, that we know is going to bring other ecosystem service benefits? And is there a piece of property or a part of a field that isn't making any money? And let's get something like that put out there um, first, instead of, well, you got to cover crop or you got to no-till your whole field, then that practice may or may not work for that grower in the first place. Yeah. And I think there's an ability sort of start tuning knobs, right? So you can do cover crops, but like how well you do those cover crops can also yield better benefits, right? So if you're able to stretch that cover crop a little bit longer, add multiple species to that cover crop, there are ways to sort of increase and improve the payout you get. So it starts linking that sort of more directly rather than did you check a box, yes or no, um, which sort of, you know, can be nice as like get, get you a floor, but it really constrains the ceiling of what you can see too in terms of the payouts in these programs. So that's a nice part. Too. Right. And- it's bringing it, bringing it to that whole system level of management, right? Really thinking about how do the products and practices across the board make this a more sustainable system? Because if we think about it as just implementing an individual practice, whether it's cover crops or no-till or just nitrogen management, if we don't look at how that impacts every other step of the crop management in that field, the practice may not be successful for the grower. The practice may not provide any environmental benefits and we may end up doing less sustainable things just because somebody said cover crops is what we need to do to be sustainable and sequester carbon. Totally. Totally. My dad uh, has been a agronomist certified, well, certified crop advisor for 26 years and an agronomist working in the field for as long as I've been alive. So 41 years. And, you know, I grew up going out to take soil samples with him, check alfalfa fields, going on grower calls, um, and just really got excited about it. Um, went to school to do vet school, um, got my undergrad. I double majored in dairy science and agronomy, got my master's in dairy nutrition, and then decided I really didn't think I wanted to go to vet school anymore and got my PhD in plant and soil science and just really enjoy working with growers to help solve these problems. And as I talk to uh, 
high school students, younger people coming up through college, trying to decide what they want to do. People are so focused. The, I, agronomy and crop science and working in agriculture is really about that problem solving piece. So if you want to solve problems, it's a good, it's a good way to go. And you like science, it's, there's just so much opportunity and it, there's, there's a ton of jobs out there too. I mean, it, I sure you see it every day too, Emma. There's a whole, especially in the sustainability area, there's just crazy how many jobs there are. I have no idea what I have said or done during the last year and a half of working at home and making my daughters listen to all of these phone calls. But um, my older daughter now has decided she wants to be an agronomist and I don't, I, I'm excited about it, but she can't quite tell me why she, she wants to be an agronomist. So I'm curious to learn what it is that she's heard or seen me do that has inspired her to, to uh, maybe consider this as a career path as well. Yeah, I, um, the problem solving and like sort of the puzzling, I think, aspect of working in food systems, agriculture, agronomy more generally, um, I come at it from a little bit of an R&D perspective. So um, I also like, I got a PhD in sort of a math programming heavy field, um, even within ecology. And so was always surrounded mostly by men and then shifted being a data scientist, also surrounded mostly by men. Uh, and now in sustainability space, often still surrounded mostly by men. I think the things that were helpful for me were one of the biggest things was like, I, there's sometimes for me, at least an inner voice that says like, oh, you shouldn't ask the question or like everyone definitely knows the answer to this question. Like, don't ask that question. And realizing that that voice not only is sometimes wrong, it's systematically wrong. Um, mm -hmm. That like for whatever the messages that I absorbed, like were that voice never leads me correctly. And so it was important to sort of acknowledge, like, I hear you voice, but also I'm just going to set you aside and not and do the opposite pretty much of what you're telling me to do. So that's been really helpful. I think the other thing is um, mentorship. Um, I bet, Sally, you sounded like with your dad having that sort of role of like, you can do this. This is something that everyone can do and that you can do in particular. For me, I had a professor in college. I was interested, still am, in how do we manage natural systems when you have human well-being and ecological integrity? Like, how do you put these systems together? And sort of had some bad experiences with science and was like, I'm done. And then had an amazing professor who was like, no, oh, come work in my lab. Like, you're going to apply to grad school, aren't you? And I was like, like, I, I guess I am. And he was like, well, you're going to apply to Princeton, right? And I was like, uh, I guess I am. Uh, and that was the only reason that I ended up going there. Um, so I can't like sort of seeking out those folks that can give you guidance is I think really important when you're underrepresented, I think probably across any, any grouping. Um, and I think Sally, you're right on like climate change is going to be a real puzzle to be solved, right, in the next five to 10 years. Um, and there's a ton of new sort of openings of space of, of companies trying to grapple with how do we solve it. So whether you're coming at it from R&D or agronomy, I think there's going to be a lot of um, puzzles to be, to be solved in this space. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity.